Next, we're going to hear from Advisor Hub's managing editor, Mason Braswell. He's going to be interviewing Manish Dave, SVP of Business Development at Ameriprise Financial. Manish leads experienced advisor recruiting at Ameriprise Financial and its mission to become the destination of choice for talented, experienced advisors. Since joining Ameriprise in late 2006, Manish has spearheaded several improvements in the firm's overall platform, resulting in increased levels of retention and productivity and significant growth in experienced advisor and practice acquisition activities. Thanks for being here, Manish. Good morning, everybody. I'm Mason Braswell. I'm the uh, managing editor for Advisor Up, as Pat said. Um, I'm excited to be interviewing Manish Deve. Uh, he is uh, head of recruiting for Ameriprise's uh, employee and uh, independent franchisee channels. Uh, and started his career in uh, the late 90s as a financial advisor at Merrill Lynch and has been with Ameriprise um, since about 2006. So he's a wealth of information on all things recruiting. Um, looking forward to hearing what he has to say and uh, we'll have some time at the end for Q&A as well. So thank you for joining us, Manish. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mason. So let's uh, uh, jump right in. Something we always are, are writing about day to day and, and interested in is uh, just the kind of state of the market for moves. Uh, are you seeing more financial advisors uh, jumping between firms these days or kind of is it just sort of flat and business as usual? Well, I think taking the, the theme of the, the conference industry in transition, um, as I think about 2019, there's been, trans there's been a lot of transition in our industry. And I, it's, it's always tough to, to kind of get the exact gauge on what's 19 uh, a bigger year than 18. It, it sure feels like one, and I think not, not just on the number of advisors that have moved, but if you look at, you know, the quality and the teams and, and the amount of assets that have moved this year, I think there's been a, you know, a constant trend for many years of uh, a lot of, I, I like to call it bank house fatigue, <laughs> and I think that's uh, contributed to a lot of the movement, and, you know, there's been a, uh, you know, movement throughout the industry, but yeah, I, I think you're, we're going to see, you know, as we look at the numbers next year and reflect back on 2019, that it was probably, I mean, we're experiencing at Ameriprise a record year in terms of assets um, that are coming over. So I, I would wow. expect that uh, others are probably in a similar spot. Well, yeah. So where do you see most of that growth coming from? We always talk about the shift to independence, but are you seeing a lot of advisors coming into, or more advisors coming into the independent side, for example, or, or the employee side? Yeah, for us, I mean, I, I, I made the comment earlier about the, the bank house and I, say it um, somewhat in jest, but I think the bank-owned wealth management firms, there's been a continuous uh, migration over the years. Um, and what I'm seeing, at least at Ameriprise, and I, you know, we, have, we have three different channels in terms of how we operate. We have our, our W-2 traditional platform, we have our 1099 channel, and we actually uh, got into the financial institution space a few years ago. Um, but the, the largest growth in terms of assets has been actually in the W-2 side of the business, which is a little contrary to sometimes what you you know, constantly hear about the breakaway advisor. Right, right. Um, but I, I think, you know, the, the theme there is just, as I talk to advisors across the country that, that at that intersection of do I make a move and if I make a move, where do I go? The theme that I constantly hear about is simplicity. Right. And uh, I think the W, you know, I if you could find the right environment, a, a W-2 model lends itself to that. On the other side, I think, you know, that uh, the 1099 businesses, including ours and other independent options out there, have also um, created some turnkey solutions as well. For sure. Do you have a Do you have a preference on where people go? Is one side more profitable? Uh, I don't. I don't. And you know, I, I I've always uh, led our business, and, and I tell this to advisors all the time. I think going to a firm that doesn't have multiple channels is a uh, is something I don't advise. I, I think right. you know having multiple channels actually is a nice check and balance on our our 1099 system makes our W2 system more entrepreneurial and, and independent thinking, um, and vice versa. Um, but I, I I lead a team of uh, 20 regional directors across the country, and they're channel agnostic because I'm channel agnostic. And, you know, really, at the end of the day, it's just finding what's right for the advisor. Right, right. And we've seen some of the wirehouses seem like they've you know, moved towards that model or, or been emphasizing that uh, flexibility as well, kind of wells uh, incentivizing advisors and making it easier for advisors to move from the employee side to the independent finance channel, for example. Uh, do you ever, do you find advisors at Ameriprise uh, shifting channel to channel very often or going employee to independent? We do, and I think it's not just, you know, inside of our shop. I actually see some independent 1099 advisors, and, you know, if you would have told me this, you know, 10 years ago that you're going to see independent advisors actually looking to um, move to a W-2 channel, I would say that's crazy. Um, but we've actually seen a trend of 
um, more independent advisors, not just in our own system, um, moving into our W2 channel, but actually in the industry. And uh, kind of going back to that theme that I mentioned of, of simplification, I mean, I could just tell you, like in my own life, I, I have uh, three teenage daughters. Oh, yeah. um, and we have a house that's got, you know, dogs and craziness and everything else. My wife and I, we, you know, we started off uh, when we got married 20 years ago in a one-bedroom apartment in New York City. And we, we, we look forward to the days where we can simplify um, our lives and kind of get back to, to just focusing on what we like to do, which isn't usually, it's usually outside of the house and, you know, time inside. Right, right. So it, it sounds like uh, part of your pitch to, uh, to advisors coming to Ameriprise. Uh, and, and you mentioned earlier that uh, I think a lot of people in the room can associate with the fact that there are so many choices out there today uh, in terms of where to go uh, and different affiliation models. Uh, how do you, as you said earlier, generate alpha for, <laughs> for advisors yeah. uh, in, in who are looking to move firms? Yeah, I mean, Mason, it's, it's just like, I mean, we talk about, uh, Tony put up the slides, and I think a lot of you know, speakers have talked about it. You know, at the end of the day, it's the same thing that clients have to do or advisors have to do for clients. How do they demonstrate uh, you know, alpha for their clients, especially in a world where um, you know, transactions obviously have gone to zero? And I, I think it's the same thing for firms. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, how does a firm really drive growth for an advisor? How do they deliver alpha? Uh, so, I mean, for us, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, we begin this time of year, we, we do business plans with 95% of our advisors. So we have 10, you know, roughly 10,000 advisors at Ameriprise. Um, we go through a really rigorous business planning process to ask them, what do you want to achieve? What are your goals for next year? Um, and not just, you know, what's your, you know, your revenue goals and your asset goals, but really breaking that down to say, you know, are you looking to, you know, execute on a succession plan? Are you looking to bring someone onto your team? Are you looking to inject more financial advice into your business? What's your client marketing system look like? Um, you know, there's so many elements of what their business plan can look like. And so how we deliver alpha is really executing then um, in surrounding that advisor with the support and the resources to actually execute their business plan. Um, and if that translates into growth, which um, for us, we've been growing advisors at, you know, close to 9% to 10% to a year over the last five years, which um, really out, outpaces a lot of the industry. Yeah, uh, is there a specific advisor you're you're targeting with that pitch? Uh, or you know, are the wirehouses kind of looking at the two million and up range, and do you have a nice niche at like then below that, or or is it all across the board? It's it's across the board. I mean, I, I, I I'm smiling because I'm just thinking about I was in Florida last week. I'm talking to an advisor, never made a move in the industry, um, 32 years at one firm managing 200 million dollars in assets, and as we all know, there's not too many people like that in the industry. Um, three decades at one place, and I asked him the question. I said. So what's your business plan for the next 10 years or, or next five years? And he's like, you know, basically started thinking. He's like, well, first off, no one's asked me that question. And he's like, I really don't have a good business plan. And, um, and so I think, and, and he was at a bank house uh, firm. And um, I was earlier in the week talking to an advisor who's in an independent, who's managing $300 million, who's all over the place and is looking right. for an operations manager, looking for help, looking for a lot of things, and is in an environment where he's just not getting a lot of support. Um, so I, I think it's across the board, um, people are looking for, you know, help so in some cases, ec you know, just articulating what a business plan is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but we all know, you know, if, if you've done a business plan before, you can articulate it all you want to. If you don't have the resources and, and tools to execute on it, it's just a piece of paper. So um, I think that's where, you know, we, we've got we've to do a, a better job as an industry and we have to do it as a firm to help actually advisors execute on their business plans. Mm -hmm. Maybe you, you've sort of answered it with uh, talking about the lack of support, but I'm interested in some in the, in the psychology of why people decide to move. What are, what are the motivating factors? Uh, you know, because it's not an easy decision as much as we write so frequently about advisors jumping here and there. It could look easy, but, but ultimately it's a, it's a difficult process and you're worried about whether clients will follow you. So what, you know, what, uh, what inspires that? Is it is it the yeah. money or is it the sport or what? I, again, I, I kind of used the analogy before about uh, just uh, the advisor-client interaction. I think it's no different to when a prospect shows up. You know, Danny was just talking about, you know, interviewing advisors. Uh, and I think it's no different than uh, that same process. When you sit down with someone, there's two variables in this equation. There's why would I want to do business with you? What's your value proposition? And then there's the economics of that equation. And right. so if I sat down, Mason, with you, and you're a financial advisor, and you told me all the great things of what it would be like to work with you, and then you told me you're going to charge me 3%, <laughs> I'd be like, that's out of balance, right? right? But if, I, I think from a firm standpoint, if you've got 
um, affirm that you know, you're not gonna have to apologize for it. It's got a gr strong financial fin foundation, really good technology, you know, the marketing capabilities. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think th we're still in a highly relationship business and are these people you wanna work with? Um, that's really important. And then the economics have to be right. And what we're trying to do is kind of strike the right balance. And I think you know, firms are trying to do that as well. Right. The winning firms will do that as well. And, and I know everybody's always interested in, in the deals. Uh, and um, where do they stand right now? I know it seemed like they maybe uh, it came down from a high watermark a few years ago when some of the wirehouses uh, in a cost-cutting move um, pulled back from recruiting. Um, are, are they back? Uh, is it as competitive as ever? And uh, where does Ameriprise uh, stand in, in that lineup? Yeah, I, I think if we probably put a graph up of advisor transition deals in Manhattan real estate, they've been pretty well correlated. Um, and you know, Manhattan real estate's actually had a couple, of, you know, softer years, but right. you know, so maybe it, it, it has come down a little bit. Um, no, I, I think it's still very um, financially enticing to, to, to move as a financial advisor, and you know, whether it's on the W-2 side of the business, I, I think they're pretty close to, if we haven't reached all-time highs again, we're pretty close to it, and there's some big firms out there, um, and, and including ours, it's very competitive around it. Um, and I think in the independent space, I, I, I've seen that, that move as well. And um, in, in the last 12 to 18 months, I think we've been seeing a, a lot more um, capital being um, in play in the independent space, and, and obviously you look at the RIA space and private equity, I think one of the slides right. that was up is just the, uh, the sources of capital are pretty, uh, pretty fluid right now. Right. Uh, are you seeing more competition from wirehouses that maybe backed out uh, a couple of years ago? Yeah, I, you know, there's, um, um, I think sometimes uh, some firms can get a little schizophrenic around are we in or right. we out and all of those things. I, ultimately, I, I believe that if um, if you have a strong value proposition and you can attract advisors, you know, attracting advisors will, will reflect whether or not you have a strong value proposition. Um, we are st starting to see some firms that may have said that they were out coming back in and um, coming back in a more purposeful way. So we'll see how it all plays out. Right. right. So it's sort of also still like the Manhattan real estate market. It continues to exactly. be competitive. Um, what about uh, protocol exits? Has that made it difficult for you all at all in terms of transitioning clients, or have you most, mostly adjusted to that? Or maybe it wasn't such a big deal since you're obviously recruiting from non-protocol firms before yeah, major exits. I, I mean, that's, that's kind of right. And 40% um, you know, of our hires come from non-protocol firms, and obviously uh, there are two large firms that, that left the protocol, you know, we're probably coming up on, on two years ago. And um, it, it really hasn't made a, you know, I think uh, initially it made a little bit of a difference, but if you look at, you know, Advisor Hub every day, um, there's, there's moves from protocol and non-protocol firms. And I, I do think the importance of um, getting good solid advice, getting good legal counsel, making sure that um, if you're going to make a move, um, you do it the right way is, is paramount. Um, but if I, I think of um, kind of our track record in helping to, to, to bring advisors over as well as navigate uh, some of the legal channels, we've, um, we've done a really good job. I haven't really seen it impact it, and, and, and nor do I see it. Um, you know, I, I'm just, uh, you know, we at Ameriprise are a big believer that um, it's advisor capitalism at its finest, and, and as much as firms may try to, you know, Tony mentioned, you know, kind of the garden leave and other provisions that are out there, and, and, and I hope the industry doesn't, you know, go in that direction, because um, I think movement makes, um, you know, at the, it's, and I think someone also said it earlier today, I mean, if, if firms had a really great value proposition, no one would ever leave. Right. Um, but I think having that check and balance is a healthy thing to have, and um, limitations to that are just, uh, you know, they're obstacles, but they're not barriers. Right, right. It's certainly free market competition. <laughs> it's the yeah. basis of the industry. It's a very entrepreneurial business. Exactly. Um, the other interesting move that we've been watching is, uh, I mentioned Wells earlier in the, in uh, different channels, and they've opened up the RA channel. I think they're only adding maybe a dozen or so advisors in this first year that it's been out. Uh, does Ameriprise have uh, something similar uh, in terms of an RA or custody offering for an independent advisor, um, or do you have plans to introduce something like that? So currently, the way we uh, we, we kind of go to market with our advisor channels is our advisors uh, kind of tuck in underneath our corporate RIA, mm -hmm. um, and um, we haven't necessarily you know moved the route of uh, just being a custodian or just having uh, advisors just kind of hold their, uh, th 
hold out on their own independent RI. It's something we're, we're looking at closely in terms of, you know, at the end of the day, I think all of our firms are, we're all in the advisor enablement business. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a matter of how you can uh, kind of create a, a great ecosystem for them to, uh, to do business. And as I sit down and I've sat down with a lot of RAs across the country, um, they have the same uh, desires, frustrations, uh, kind of visions for their business that any independent advisor as well as any um, W-2 advisor has. So um, nothing here to announce, but it's something that we're, 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 we're looking at very closely. All right, that makes sense. Uh, it, what about the other big topic on everybody's mind is succession planning. Um, do you all see an opportunity as uh, for advisors maybe later in their careers who are either looking to uh, monetize their business or, um, you know, how are you also dealing sort of internally with advisors who yeah. um, may be looking at their own retirement at Ameriprise? I guess it's kind of two separate questions baked in there. But, um. We don't really see an opportunity in succession planning. We don't think it's just a buzz. <laughs> it's fad. It's not going to happen. It's, it's, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's clear as day. I mean, it's a... Um, uh, the aging of the client is the same as the aging of our industry, and um, it is uh, paramount for us. I mean, we'll do, in our system, roughly uh, 500 full or per partial practice purchases a year. Um, and so having a very close, tight, uh, woven network, as, as we do at Ameriprise, um, that's a big part of, you know, I think why people join us as well as why people stay. And so um, we constantly have... Uh, people that are joining us that are looking to bring in other people into their business, um, to you know, people who are just straight up executing their, their succession plan. And so, you know, in, in a model where it is uh, more consistency in terms of the client experience, you know, obviously uh, as a leader in financial planning and advice for um, as many years as we have, it's, uh, it's one where the multiples of the business can actually, uh, you know, are, are, are higher as we've proven out um, when people do come out to sell uh, their practice. So it, right. it's a huge part of every every element of our business. Do you have a sense of the average age of advisors at, uh, at Ameriprise, either maybe on the, across the employee and, and independent side? Yeah, I think the, you know, the average age for the industry is around 58, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. We're uh, slightly younger than that. We're about 56 to 55. Our W-2 channel is probably um, maybe one or two years younger than that. But it's um, you know, it's, it's a challenge for all of us in the right. industry. And I think that's where, you know, there's very few firms that are obviously training. Uh, we'll bring uh, about 500 novice advisors into our business every year. Um, they're usually getting tucked into a, a, a team um, on, our, on our independent business. But that's a, uh, you know, the training element, um, it's not the years of training, you know, two, 3,000 a year, uh, but the training element of this industry is still, still really important. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. A lot of the firms, uh, too, find that those programs have very low uh, graduation rates. Uh, do you have a sense of how well those, those 500 do, you know, a few years out, or most of them still there? Yeah, actually, retention rates are kind of mid-80s to, to higher. And I think wow. part of it is, um, as I mentioned, it's a lot of it's independent practitioners bringing them on board. Right. So when they're taking the, the, you know, the capital risk of, you know, technology, real estate, benefits, all of those things, um, they're, and, and bringing them into a team environment is, is key. But that's, uh, talk to, you know, there's obviously a lot of practitioners right here in the room. I mean, one of the hardest, one of the biggest challenges that I think they face is, uh, is human capital. And how do we, um, you know, how does the industry support them in terms of uh, delivering on not just finding the human capital, but, but developing and retaining as well? Where do you, uh, where, where are most of those candidates coming from? Is it, uh, college or university students that you're getting out in front of, or is it just connections from advisors who happen to know somebody in their community that they want to bring onto their team? Or? You know, it's all of the above. Um, I, I think actually some of the, the colleges have done a really nice job with CFP programs across the country that have, you know, the dedicated programs where uh, whether it's an apprenticeship model um, or bringing people into the business um, is, is, is still a great uh, way to do it. Um, very different than a lot of us probably got in the business where, you know, you're in your early 20s and just kind of hoping that someone's going to trust you with their, with their savings. Um, but, I, I, you know, clearly the, the CFPs are a big one, too. I think also uh, career changers is another one. And, you know, you think about the careers of financial advisor, it's, it's fantastic. Someone said it earlier today. I mean, you really get to know the most about, about people than anyone else. And so um, I, I think, you know, we're, we're starting to see more of that, but I think we could do a, a better job across the industry of bringing more career changers into the industry. Right. Um, Shifting back a little bit to the to the deal side, uh, is 
um, you know, some of the wirehouses maybe have been a little bit less consistent on either what they're offering or whether they're offering anything or uh, in the recruiting game. Uh, Ameriprise seems to have been fairly kind of solidly in for uh, several years. Uh, you know, what, what allows Ameriprise to maintain this level of commitment of, you know, one recruiter I spoke to said, well, Ameriprise is less debt on its balance sheet, so <laughs> they're easy, it's easier yeah. for them to kind of, uh, you know, keep this as a, an expense cost for the firm. Um, you know, what's, what's the, the mantra there? Yeah. Um, well, we do believe consistency is a strategy. So Jim Cracciola, who's been leading our, is our chairman CEO of our company, has been there for 20, almost 20 years. Um, in financial services, that's, as we know, a rare breed. So I think the consistency of that strategy is, 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 is really top of mind. Um, yeah, financial found, uh, having a, a strong financial foundation helps. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we have an ROE of over $32 billion of excess capital sitting on the balance sheet. Uh, you don't see Ameriprise making a lot of big acquisitions. I mean, it's right. not something that we're, um, you know, we're, we're always kind of looking for if there's a good cultural fit and makes sense. But ultimately, we're looking to deploy our capital for people who want to join us and, and, and actually believe in what we're trying to do and see us as a, as a firm that can really, you know, as I mentioned earlier, add alpha. Um, so, you know, what we'd like to do is um, essentially take the financials off the table in that, and listen, I, I think to some degree, um, a lot of us in the industry, not that we'll ever get there, so if you're thinking this is gonna happen, it's not, but you know, if you just, if deals went off the table and everyone just had to compete on the merits of their value proposition, right. like, I'd look forward to that day. Um, but that day's not here, and, and I don't think it should be given the risk and what you're asking someone to, to take, as well as um, just the, the value of a business that advisors have built. Um, but what we, what we try to do is actually, um, you know, financially make it as competitive out there in the industry. So we, there's not a lot of having to talk about that, and we could really then focus on, can we really be a trusted partner with you in helping you execute whatever your vision, your business plan is? And if that makes sense, then um, we're going to find the right partner. If if it's just about the financial transaction, then um, then you're really just finding. Um, I think advisors and partners that are going to rent your business and not necessarily, you know, fully be on board. Right. Are we ever going to see 400% uh, deals or are they already out there as, <laughs> as recruiters like to tell us? I, I don't know if they're out there, but, you know, I, every prediction I've probably made about, you know, Mindy talked about 100% and, you know, if you would have asked me, would we be where we are today? I, you know, God bless America. <laughs> um, um, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't, nothing would be shocking to me. And especially you look at the multiples of some businesses going on the, uh, you know, in, in the private equity space and how they're valuing businesses. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of capital, as I mentioned earlier, especially in a low interest rate environment uh, that I don't think will change for, uh, um, for the foreseeable future. Right, and I guess part of it is you're also competing with the value that the advisor could get if they just took their business and ran it themselves independently. No, that's right. And, you know, and I think this is where I challenge um, a lot of advisors, I think, sometimes make the, 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 the decision to go independent or even RIA based on economics. And clearly, economics play into it. But if you actually, and, and, you know, you sit down and you do the math on some of the W-2 sides of the business and, um, and some of the offerings there, if you factor in all of the, um, you know, the payout factors, all the, you know, the hard dollars as well as the real estate benefits, all the other things that, that, that a W-2 model can offer, it really comes out pretty close. Um, and so that's where it really, you know, what I challenge people to really think about is what type of environment do they really want to create and, you know, do they really want to serve their client and, and, and have their teams operate in and make a decision from there. Some people want a W-2 model, some people a 1099 or more independent model makes more sense and that's where I get back to having choice is, is a benefit. And, um, and I think that's a, you know, that's a core part of our value proposition. All right. Uh, on the W-2 side, um, the compensation is always an important part, not just the transition deal, but um, kind of the year-to-year -year changes. Uh, have you all uh, finalized uh, the 2020 compensation plan? Are there any changes there, or is it mostly... You know, I think we're in the same? process still of, of rolling those out. I think, like, most firms will announce those in probably the next few weeks. Um, but by and large, I mean, we're not looking to, you know, like a lot of non-bank wealth management firms, we're not looking to, to, to move the cheese right. you know, dramatically year over year. Um, you obviously want to incent, you know, the right behaviors in terms of taking care of the client and growing a business, but, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of, you know, our, our, our comp plan is not one that uh, requires, an, you know, a, a PhD in math to, 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 to get to. Um, but I also think that's one of the values of working with 
um, some of the consultants in the room, and you know, there's a lot of partners in, in the search industry that I think are, are, are really are really valuable in helping to figure out, you know, what is the value of my business? What is, uh, you know, if I went to a, a W-2 model versus a 1099 model, and um, I look at that, and you know, if you look at Advisor Hub, I mean, there's a, um, what what Jeff Crosby's built over at 3x Equity Partners is, is a really good example of that. I think you know Jeff does a nice job of helping. Uh, and, and a lot of people here in the room do of, of helping people navigate, um, you know, what what channels and what firms and what the payouts are on that side of it. You know, they're never perfect. Um, you have to go through, you know, a, a firm directly, I think, to understand their economics. But um, you know, whether it's uh, the information on, on Advisor Hub or what's out there, I think they're usually actually pretty accurate. I was sort of self-interested in asking that question. We have a story coming out today at 1:30 on one of the. Uh one of the wirehouses uh, compensation plans for 2020, so it should be interesting just to yeah. On that, it's, that. <laughs> it's it's like I, it's, and I, I started off in the industry, you know, obviously at Merrill, and I think like a lot of people did, and it's, it, it just still is a head scratcher to me because I feel like the same playbook is just got dropped on the streets, and and people right. are running a lot of the same plays, and um, I you know obviously it's to a lot of you know my firms benefit, a lot of other firms benefit, um, but I. You know the clone wars that are happening um, as as we speak are, are are doing many things. I don't think necessarily helping advisors and clients is, is necessarily one of them. I would argue. Right, right. Uh, with that, I want to leave some time for for audience questions. Uh, anybody have anything for uh, for Manish? And I think I'm getting the signal uh, right. hit from the back. Uh, we're ready to wrap it up. All right. But uh, thank you, Manish. All right. Appreciate Jason, it. Thank you. Thanks, guys.